Hello, my name is Deacon Nicholas Denisenko. I am currently Assistant Professor of Theological Studies and Director of the Huffington Ecumenical Institute at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. I have been leading this online learning class in ecumenical theology at the Ukrainian Catholic University, and it is my pleasure today to present to you a brief lecture on ecumenical theology. Throughout this course, you've been reading about the history and principles of ecumenical theology by researching the documentation from a variety of traditions. In this lecture, I would like to revisit the matter by examining the status of the question. This lecture is divided into the following primary sections. First, I will parse out the primary causes of ecumenical theology by considering the problem of schism. And I will also problematize the whole matter of ecumenical theology by discussing the emergence of vocabulary that comes to be, uh, be known as uh, markers of identity. In the next section, I will, and concurrent with the first section, I will look at some of the issues that have coalesced around ecumenical theology. And then in the final section, I will summarize approaches to ecumenical theology and propose my own direction for uh, suggestions that might be adopted by those who are devoted to the enterprise of doing ecumenical theology. First, please allow me to make this clear from the very beginning that this presentation is a summary and it is a survey of some issues. It is not at all designed to be a chronological historical exploration of each and every issue that led up to uh, instances of ecumenical theology throughout Christian history. Rather, the purpose of this lecture is for us to try to identify and discern patterns on how ecumenical theology responds to issues and situations that occurred within the church and sometimes amongst churches that have disagreements that were caused by historical events or uh, different applications or approaches to theology and so forth. So I would like to begin by examining some issues. First, I would like to say that um, the issues of, that really serve as the impetus for ecumenical theology are often caused by church schisms, by heresy, and also by the pattern or the exercise of, of an ecclesial self-reflection. So schism, heresy, and ecclesial self-reflection are some of the causes of ecumenical theology, and we'll explore some of the more interesting causes a little bit uh, later in this lecture. Now, theological issues are always at the forefront of ecumenical theology. I believe that this paradigm, which has existed for the majority of Christian history, is now beginning to shift in post-modernity, and I will turn to that again a little bit later in this lecture. Um, first, let's talk about what's at stake in ecumenical theology. What is at stake is the community's confession of faith in the triune God. Uh, and we might refer to this as a common confession of faith or a consensus on a confession of faith. The disagreements on the understanding of who Jesus is is what led up to the articulation, for example, of the Nicene-Constantinopolitan Creed. Um, so in essence, this is a matter of both faith and order because disagreements on the confession of faith in the triune God historically created disorder and disruption to the order of a community. Um, and what's also at stake, a derivative point, but no less important, is eschatological destiny. 
The reason that faith is important is because Christians believe that, that life does not end at death and that death has been transformed by the risen Christ into a passage to new life, which will bring those who have died into the eternal presence of the living God. So that makes it important, necessary, for Christians in this life to confess faith in the one with whom they will share the privilege of eternal life. To put it quite bluntly and to put it in colloquial terms, uh, it would not be good for anyone to confess faith in a Christ that they have imagined, perhaps in a Christ that is the result of an illusion or a fantasy, only to discover in the next life that the real Christ, the true Jesus Christ, along with the Father and the Spirit, were actually quite different from the one that had been imagined. This is why precise, accurate, truthful confession of faith in Jesus Christ and in the triune God, is what is at stake in ecumenical theology. Now, what were some of the theological issues that necessitated ecumenical theology? A good example of this comes from the New Testament. Jesus' discourse in the Bread of Life in the chapter 6 of the Gospel of John we see here that theological misunderstandings or even divergent interpretations of Christ's nature and personhood are issues that required resolution. The specter of cannibalism caused some of Jesus' disciples to abandon him, as St. John tells us. We also note that in the Johannine Corpus of Epistles, the, uh, a similar claim is made that it is false belief in God that makes one into an antichrist. And here we might consider the possibility that a reference to an antichrist could be a reference to the betrayal of a confession of faith that one had made at baptism. There's a hypothesis that anointing with chrism was the primary ritual element of initiation in the Johannine community, so that one who violated the community's confession of faith was ultimately being an antichrist, was, was uh, betraying that which they had actually received or been clothed in. So it is the attempt to make sense of the precise fusion of nature and person in Christ that is, that is at stake, and this is what caused Christians to have to coalesce together and to create a consensus on what it is that they actually believed, or, or to say it better, whom they were confessing faith in. So Christology is one of the primary issues that comes into play here. So for example, deficiencies in the theology of Arius, who believed that uh, Jesus was just a super angel, or the patriarch Nestorius of uh, Constantinople, for example, it was deficiencies in their theology, and they're not the only two examples, but they're two very important examples, that led to conciliar confessions of faith that communicated the church's common belief in the triune God. I also have in the list here the heresy of the uh, Pnevma Tomachians that resulted in the Council of Constantinople. So the Council of Nicaea gathered to resolve the problem of the teaching of Arius. The Council of Constantinople in the year 381 in part addressed the problem of deficiency in the teaching uh, understanding on who the Holy Spirit is. The Council of Ephesus in the year 431 addressed the question uh, that was raised by Nestorius uh, on, the, on the nature and divinity of Christ. And the Council of Chalcedon in 451 attempted to precisely define that Jesus is one person in two natures. Now, when we come to the Council of Chalcedon, we see how the Christological matter became more complicated since the majority of Egyptian Christians rejected the Christological formula of Chalcedon. In other words, uh, the Council of Chalcedon is something that we can consider to be ecumenical theology. It's an attempt to articulate the church's consensus of faith, 
with precision to say that this is what we all believe. And I already said in the previous, uh, earlier in this slide, well, why this is important to the life of the church. But at the time of the Council of Chalcedon, uh, one could not account for linguistic nuances that simply could not capture the entirety of the theological precision in the Greek confession of faith that was iterated at the Council of Chalcedon. And the result of this was a schism in the church, a schism that persists to this day. For example, all of the Oriental Orthodox do not accept the Council of Chalcedon. So Armenians, uh, the churches of West Syria, the Coptic Church, these these are churches that are known to be either monophysite, churches that teach that Jesus has one nature as opposed to two, um, or they might call those who do not accept the Council of Chalcedon non-Chalcedonians, those who do not, do not accept the Council of Ephesus are Nestorians, and of course for many years in church history those who do not accept the Council of Nicaea were Arians. So what we see here is this sort of parallel development that necessitates an even newer kind of ecumenical theology. If conciliar theology was ecumenical theology in post-modernity, or we might say modernity in post-modernity, the attempt to resolve ancient differences where the groups who did not concept, uh, uh, accept conciliar theology continued to exist on their own, they came to be known with uh, vocabulary, with nomenclature that designated them as those who were outside of the boundaries of the church. In other words, heretics. And they weren't simply heretics, but they had specific names. Those who followed the Arian teaching, or we might um, refer to it as Arianism, some branch within the family of the teaching of Arius, were Arians. And the same then is true of Nestorians non-Chalcedonians, Monophysites, and many other heresies. These terms, this nomenclature, differentiated the Orthodox from the heretics. And it's important to note that they were used for canonical distinction, to make distinctions to say that this is the Orthodox faith and this is not. But they were also used polemically. So when the ecumenical movement gained momentum in the 19th, 20th, centuries as proponents had to find new and creative ways to navigate the problems that were caused by terms that were viewed as offensive. Okay. What are the causes of schism? This is perhaps going back a little bit, and I want to begin here with an important presupposition. Uh, ecumenical theology is frequently a response to a problem among the churches, especially schism, and I've illustrated that in the previous example. But this is not always the case. One can conceive of an ecumenical theology that seeks to affirm a sister church within the communion of the churches. So there, there's other possibilities. It's not always a response to a problem. So ecumenical theology is a rather broad and fluid term. Uh, or we might say a broad and a fluid concept. But historically, ecumenical theology developed as a way to respond to divisions that disrupted church life and ultimately broke the communion of the church. So in the previous example, what I've been hinting at is that ecumenical theology can be construed as a theological consensus that's, that is held by the entire church. That is why it begins with uh, either I believe, the creeds begin with I believe or we believe. Whether it's the first person singular or the second, or, or the second, uh, the first person plural or the first person singular, I or we, it's basically the same thing. The church is speaking with one voice. This is what the church believes. Now, the example of the creed is crucial for this understanding. Because from one perspective, the churches that recite the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed do so in unison, with one voice. Now here we have to say that there's an obvious exception, and that exception is the Filioque Clause, which I'll briefly allude to a little bit later in this lecture. The whole point 
of inserting the creed into the Eucharistic liturgy, noting that its native ritual home is baptism, is to confess faith in the same triune God and the promise of his salvation given to all. So the Nicene Creed was composed by the fathers at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 and completed in the year 381 at the Council of Constantinople. Let me add a historical caveat here. Um, the uh, proceedings of the Council of Constantinople did not survive. So the way that we know that the creed was completed at the Council of Constantinople was because the proceedings from the Council of Chalcedon tell us so. Now, we know that the fathers who gathered at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 crafted language and employed vocabulary that was designed to correct false belief and thus reconcile those who held false belief to the church. Now, this creates a, a whole series of problematic issues. On the one hand, the, the creed is formative. When one recites the creed, this is to shape their faith. They are to conform whatever ideas that they have about God to what the creed says about God. The creed also is conciliatory. It's designed to reconcile, to bring those who profess false belief into conformity with the church. It's an opportunity for rehearsal, for right belief. So in this case, ecumenical theology developed as a conciliar response to a Christological crisis that had created ruptures within the very fabric of Constantinople itself. Now, the ecumenical theology contains an inner tension because it simultaneously confesses the consensus of church belief on Christ's divine nature and at the same time refutes the false belief of erroneous thinking. So to, again, put it very simply, the formulation of the creed is uh, saying this is what the one church believes. This is the right belief. Um, and it's wagging its finger at those who believe falsely. You do not have the right belief. But if you can confess this creed and adopt it and interiorize it. So that the words of this creed shape your own belief you can be reconciled to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So in the Council of Nicaea, it was the Arian heresy that caused the Emperor Constantine to ask the fathers of the church to gather for the council. And the verbiage, the language of the Nicene Creed was designed to precisely state who is Jesus to answer that problematic question. And again, in the Council of Constantinople, the uh, language concerning the worship of the Holy Spirit, who, who is worshipped together with the Father and the Son, and glorified together with the Father and the Son, was addressing the Pneumatomachian heresy that believed that the Holy Spirit uh, did not, uh, that either confused the Holy Spirit with Christ or did not believe that the Holy Spirit was divine. But we also have another example of um, ecumenical theology that in a certain sense, in, in a new positive way, attempts to both address the problem of, of, of schism through a process of ecclesial self-reflection. And this is in the aftermath of Vatican II, Pope Paul VI Apostolic Constitution on Confirmation, which essentially, through a process of ecclesial self-reflection, that the Roman Church recognized that uh, that pneumatology had, in a certain sense, been deficient in Roman Catholic sacramental theology. And in an attempt to bolster the sacrament of confirmation, Pope Paul VI reformed it in both its ritual, its text, and also its definition through his apostolic constitution by adopting the Byzantine formula that is recited at the anointing of chrism, which is the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit, and also by surrounding the ritual texts and structure with uh, much stronger allusions to the imparting of the gift of the Holy Spirit at the laying on of hands and the anointing with chrism. 
Now, this is different because this is not wagging the finger at those who believe wrongly, but what this was was the Catholic Church understanding itself as a universal church and honoring its Eastern churches by incorporating their pneumatology. Now, some of us believe that this is liturgical Byzantinization and that this is problematic, but what this was was a consultation of Eastern theology that resulted in an inscription of a Lectio Selecta, if you will, of Eastern theology on the Catholic Church. And this is a very creative way to attempt to mute, to mitigate the problem of schism by honoring things, honoring elements of a tradition, of the Eastern tradition with whom the Roman Church had been in schism, um, in such a way that the Roman Church actually embraced some of those elements that it had won once uh, considered to be theologically problematic. Now, obviously, there are many other issues that resulted in uh, ecumenical theology that occurred either in the later medieval era or uh, more frequently in the modern era. The obvious issue here that we might point to is the problem of the filioque, which was imposed upon the Latin church um, as an attempt to denote the full equality of Christ with the Father in the Creed. So in a, uh, oddly enough, in a certain sense, the filioque itself was an attempt to engage ecumenical theology, but it became something much, much different that was complicated by some of the disputes that, had occur that were occurring within the Greek and the Latin-speaking churches from the 9th uh, through the 15th centuries in particular. And these disputes well, there has been some agreement in the filioque in Roman Catholic and Orthodox uh, ecumenical dialogue in the 20th and 21st centuries. There are still theologians who believe that this is an irreconcilable issue unless the Roman Catholic Church excises a filioque from the creed. Um, another issue that has uh, impacted ecumenical theology is the dynamics of primacy, synodality, and episcopal ministry, and I'll have more to say about that a little bit later. Um, but uh, the reason I bring this up is that when we think of the tensions between the churches today, they often, uh, the, the primary cause of these tensions, whether it's between Roman Catholics and Protestants or Roman Catholics and Orthodox, is the particular definition of the exercise of ministry of the Bishop of Rome. And when we talk about this, we need to remember that Primacy never really existed as a vacuum. So when we referred, for example, to the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, this in itself is a reminder to us that um, sometimes primacy was subservient to uh, imperial intrigues. When we think about the fact that the uh, Emperor Constantine convoked the Council of Nicaea in the year uh, 325, this, in a certain sense, mitigates a, a modern or a, or a postmodern understanding of primacy. And I bring this up to remind us that we need to look at history holistically uh, and to consult all of it, which is one of the most important 20th century approaches to ecumenical theology in order to develop a theology that could actually address the problematic issues. Now, on a related note, it is not always theological issues that result in an ecumenical theology. Sometimes geopolitical considerations also contribute to the process. And there are dozens of examples on this. And I had to remove some of them from this uh, lecture platform in order to preserve enough time to give due diligence to the issues that we're going to discuss. But an obvious example here is uh, the Council of Florence Ferrara of the year 1438 and 1439, which was a council that attempted to reunite the Catholic and the Orthodox churches into Eucharistic union. And in fact, uh, an agreement was reached, but unfortunately, some might say unfortunately, some would say fortunately, the council was not received by the Orthodox churches. Um, now, the now, this council discussed important theological matters. Um, but what's important here is to keep in mind that the uh, Byzantine Empire was uh, very much aware of its weakness and the growing Ottoman power and uh, had an interest in crafting a union with Rome 
in order to entice Roman military help to help to stave off the Ottomans. And history tells us, of course, that, that um, not only did the council fail, but the attempt for military intervention also failed as Constantinople fell in the year 1453. But it's an example to us that uh, sometimes there are geopolitical contributions that uh, we sometimes think of things as being purely ecumenical and only focused on theological issues, but sometimes the political intrigues interfere and contribute to those conversations. Uh, the whole history of the of iconoclasm is a, a classic example of this, but, um, but I want to focus on two examples uh, as a way to sort of round this out. The first is the conflict between Gregory Palamas, who is commemorated by the Orthodox Church in the second Sunday of Lent, and Barlam of Calabria, um, who believed that Palamas was um, defying apophatic theology, the notion that God is, is completely unapproachable and unknowable and that we can only say what God is not. Um, in the year 1341, a council of Constantinople uh, upheld Gregory Palamas's teaching and uh, the, the defense of the hesychastic tradition of uh, interior and silent prayer through which one could achieve union with God and participate in the divine life of God, which uh, an, it put in another way is a classical take on the Eastern teaching of theosis or deification, which sometimes Roman Catholics call divinization. What's interesting in all of this is that uh, Barlam was an Orthodox monk who later uh, became Roman Catholic. And he attacked Palamas and the Hesychasts for their teaching. And this, this uh, proclamation, defense of orthodoxy in the part of Constant, uh, the Council of Constantinople, and then the appointment of the second Sunday of Lent as the Sunday that commemorates St. Gregory Palamas in the Orthodox Church calendar, came to be celebrations of victory over Roman heresy that's attributed to Barlam. So a theology that could have been ecumenical in a certain sense went the other way and became very anti-ecumenical. Um, the defense of orthodoxy in remembering uh, Gregory Palamas had a, a second a motive or impetus attached to it, and that was to stick it to the Roman Catholics uh, by associating Barlam with the Roman Catholics and saying that this is essentially a Catholic heresy, even though Barlam was Orthodox at the time of uh, the apogee of the crisis. Another example of this is the interpretation of the Union of Brest Litovsk in the year 1596. Uh, some historians look at this as an attempt to uh, achieve what had always existed between uh, the in the Kievan Metropolia, which was founded before the schism of the year 1054. Christianity was established in Kiev in the year 988. So the Union of Brest-Litovsk, some view as an ecumenical union, as a way for uh, the Orthodox to... Uh, Reachieve and reestablish Eucharistic union with the Church of Rome. Uh, others believe that this was a way, uh, that this was a completely political thing, and that the bishops who entered into union with Rome did so because uh, they were being pressured by the Polish nobility, because at the time um, that uh, region of Ukraine was under Polish rule. And which then necessitated the reestablishment of an Orthodox hierarchy in Kiev in the year 1620. Now, what's really interesting in all of this is not only the interpretation of this, I use this as an illustration to show you how geopolitical considerations muddy the waters in the way that we view ecumenical theology. But in addition to this, we have uh, really the emergence of ecumenical theology in the Orthodox Church. Because Peter Mohila, uh, who is St. Peter Mohila, 
And all of the Ukrainian Orthodox churches, canonized as a saint in the year 1996, uh, published a liturgicon, which uh, essentially adopted elements from Roman Catholic theology. And this was uh, the culmination of a long process of Orthodox Christians utilizing Western scientific methods of study, philosophical categories, and essentially the Jesuit model of education, which had uh, made its way into Poland. Another way of looking at this is, is that the, the Orthodox theology developed in such a way so that it was Westernized, but I would argue remained fully Orthodox. However, in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, the neo-patristic synthesis in Orthodox theology, um, one of its pioneers was George Florowski, uh, essentially condemned this westernization of orthodox theology as a pollution of orthodox theology and claimed that this was the pseudomorphosis of orthodox theology, which had abandoned the neopatristic tradition and thus become something completely different. Um, now, uh, we need to look at this in a new way perhaps today, and for much more uh, information on this, I would refer you to the intellectual biography of George Florowski uh, by the excellent Orthodox theologian uh, Deacon Paul Gavrilyuk, which was recently published by Oxford University Press, where uh, he, along with, um, he's, he's one theologian among many other Orthodox theologians, such as Aristotle, Papa Nicolaou, and George Demacopoulos, who are uh, trying to resuscitate, or at least bring to the attention of global scholarship, the fact that there were many Orthodox Christians who embraced and viewed Western theological uh, categories of thinking quite positively. Um, but this is a, an example of just how muddy the waters are of ecumenical theology. And I, my claim, my assertion here, is that the Orthodox theology that Peter Mohilla developed and essentially um, put into print with his liturgicon was uh, in response to his context, but it was an instance of embracing a theological category of thinking that an Orthodox Christian could embrace. In other words, it was an act of ecumenical theology. Um, the last point that I want to make here goes back to something in the previous slide. Just to show continuity in history, I said that... Um, that there are terms that develop, that, be, that enter into nomenclature, that uh, necessitate a, a new way of doing ecumenical theology. So in the Reformation, Luther, in his uh, many complaints on papal indulgences and on uh, the Babylonian captivity of the church, this is a worthy read if you have time, began to refer to Roman Catholics as papists. Now, this, of course, is a caricature of Roman Catholic theology, um, but one that necessitates uh, the adoption of a new way of looking at it today. Now, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit, because basically what I've done in this first part of the lecture is given you selections of examples that show how divisions within the community on theological issues necessitate the development of an ecumenical theology, which sometimes results in the creation of a vocabulary that uh, identifies who's on the right side of theological thinking and thus representative of the church's consensus of the confession of faith and who's on the wrong side. I want now to explore some contemporary issues that have come into play that uh, continue to muddy the waters, but deserve our attention. Um, the examples that I gave you before come from late antiquity and the entirety of the medieval era through the Reformation into the Counter-Reformation. And once we enter into modernity, we have the emergence of the nation state. Now, the emergence of the nation state, um, this presents uh, opportunities for a new view on understanding of theological issues that uh, ecumenical theology now has the opportunity to look at. It's the, it's the development of a uh, paradigm shift. It's a new opportunity for all Christians to view through the same lens uh, the 
emergence of a problem. Now, the first problem that I would like to call attention to is the problem of the nation state. This uh, situation created problems, particularly within the Orthodox Church, although it did really throughout the whole world. Um, there are some historians, uh, particularly uh, political historians, who viewed the emergence of the nation state as, as something that could only occur through an act of violence. Um, but the emergence of the nation state um, led to new schisms within the churches. So, for example, the Orthodox Church in Bulgaria um, was not in communion with the other Orthodox churches because uh, for a short while it only permitted ethnic Bulgarians to be members of the Orthodox Church, which led to a Council of Constantinople in the year 1872, which condemned the heresy of ethnophilitism. This controversy is considerably worse. Uh, we see raging in Ukraine today a terrible war, um, and it is a war that uh, that rides in some sense and depends in some sense on the whole question of sovereignty and independence and the right of a nation to chart its own path without having to continue to uh, serve a, a larger, more wealthy nation. And in, in this case, we're talking about Russia. This situation uh, it became a crisis in the orthodox attempt on the part of Ukrainians to uh, established their own autocephalous or completely independent church in 1921. A schism occurred among the Orthodox in Ukraine in 1921 that has yet to be healed today. And it is my conviction, and I would uh, uh, say this very clearly here, that if all of the Christians of the world could together, in one voice, look at the question of the relationship between nation building national identity and religious identity, this could be an opportunity to develop a beautiful ecumenical theology that could help to resolve schisms within, so for example, the Orthodox Church to help resolve the Ukrainian system, but also it could strengthen pastoral work uh, in multinational contexts. So for example, in the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Los Angeles, it is a multi-ethnic archdiocese. It happens to be the largest Catholic archdiocese in the world. And here, some question of the relationship between national identity and religious identity uh, could certainly bolster pastoral work in this area. Um, I'm going to turn to a much less pleasant topic for most pastors, and that is the topic that is raging within postmodernity today. today and that is the cultural wars and human sexuality. And here is where I think we will see uh, a much more potent and explosive paradigm shift from theological issues to issues of human uh, anthropology. So this is where we'll see the paradigm shift in ecumenical theology. The global interest and affirmation of gay marriage is causing a disruption in sacramental order. Now, I want to make it very clear here that I think that it is uh, a reduction to say that it is only gay marriage that has a disruption to the sacramental order, as the extraordinary synod on the family has illuminated through its robust discussions. Um, it is not only gay marriage, but it is also the phenomenon of divorce of cohabitation and uh, also of uh, personal uh, gender affiliation, which uh, is uh, raising questions on sacramental order. And what I mean by that is if a couple that is, so for example, if a couple that is um, legally married in a homosexual relationship approaches a pastor and expresses a desire to be baptized and anointed with chrism, how does the pastor address that issue? What happens if people who are already baptized and chrismated and confirmed within the church um, get divorced? Should they be permitted to partake of the Eucharist? Um, if one of them uh, gets a legal divorce and then marries someone of the same gender, uh, are they automatically cut off from the Eucharistic communion? These are the issues that ecumenical theology is now coalescing around. And as we saw 
in the historical examples, the ecumenical theology is both an attempt to build a consensus in the sense it's a paradox. So remember that it is a paradox. It is both an attempt to um, establish consensus and it is also divisive at the same time. So for example, a great deal of ecumenical theology concerns a common Christian witness in defending traditional marriage. Now, there are lots of examples of such defenses. One of them is the Manhattan Declaration from the year 2009, where uh, representatives of all of the, of the churches that defended traditional marriage, defining marriage as between one man and one wo woman, uh, signed the Manhattan Declaration. But there are other Christians who... <clears throat> Uh, si are signing statements of support for the equal rights of homosexuals within the church on the basis of uh, St. Paul's teaching in, in his letter to the Galatians 27, 28, which is a sort of a Christian egalitarianism where a Christian is one who is clothed in Christ. They are not one who can be set aside based on their gender, based on whether or not they are free or a slave, um, or based on whether or not they are a Jew or uh, a Greek. So what we're basically seeing happening in the contemporary milieu is this paradigm shift in ecumenical theology where the pattern is the same. The pattern is that an issue that needs pastoral deliberation is causing disruption within the church. It's challenging the confession of faith within the church. And it's also causing disruption to the order, the sacramental order of the church. But in this case, it's not a Christological or a pneumatological issue. By extension, one could make that argument, but I think it would be difficult for that argument to hold together. It is a moral issue. So the, the current church statements that are de being developed at the local level are designed to illuminate a common understanding of what marriage is. So what we're seeing here is that moral issues are replacing theological ones. And a common understanding of what marriage is, is replacing what was, from the late antique and the medieval era, a confession of faith. And the, the difference between these two things is, and this is something that I think the ecumenical theologians of today really need to be careful in what they agree to sign, is we can say that I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. But do we believe, can one say, I believe in the union of one man and one woman in marriage? I would hesitate to go so far as to say that. Um, perhaps there is another verb that could be used. This is the kind of issue that requires a robust ecumenical theology. Right? Um, now, the, the, the other pattern that we need to keep in mind that I've established from the beginning of this lecture is that ecumenical theology, while it has been formulated to express consensus in a confession of faith, in so doing it has often created more division. So then, what approach should Christians take in ecumenical theology today? Obviously, I have outlined some very difficult issues that we all know need to be addressed, but let's first take a review of some of the approaches that have been adopted. In the 18th and 19th centuries, we have the development of Rezor's Mont. Um, this is the adoption of a study of all of the sources of church history in a shift from scholastic theology to a more holistic approach to what the church is and what the church believes by looking at uh, the entirety of church history. The Razor Smart move, movement finds its uh, origins in the scientific study of the Bible, the employment of biblical studies, and the discovery of sources of antiquity and late antiquity, particularly those from the patristic era. All right. So one of the approaches to ecumenical theology is uh, to be able to consult sources from church history and to say that these sources speak to today's needs. 
And we can all gather together around the Asauruses and say that we can adopt the Asauruses because they are traditional and this aspect of tradition really fits the needs of today's church. And it is my opinion that this is precisely what Vatican II was attempting to do. Certainly, this is what the liturgical movement, the Oxford movement, the Cambridge movement, and, uh, for example, the creation of the right of Christian initiation of adults are uh, based upon. They're based upon a foundation of resource mod theology. Now, there are other aspects, other phenomena, which impacted the approach to ecumenical theology, and one of those was the urgency, in particular an eschatological urgency. The societal shifts of the 20th and the 21st centuries, um, these heightened an eschatological awareness, the finite nature of the world and of the life in which we live. So it was not that long ago that we saw uh, many Christian communities and certainly individuals and nations throughout the world honor the centennial anniversary of the Armenian Genocide in 1915. The 20th century was a century of bloodshed, death, exile, uh, and genocide. There are many genocides from that century, and we're seeing this pattern uh carry right over into the 21st century. The uh, stark impact that the colossal, epic loss of life had upon important thinkers in the 20th and the 21st centuries contributed to a recovery of an eschatological awareness. The notion that church leaders will have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and answer for their pastoral work, an answer for the for, for the message that they communicated, their uh, promise to fulfill, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to impart that gospel teaching to the people who are entrusted to them. A good example of this eschatological awareness that led to a new eschatological impetus was uh, the work of Sergius Bulgakov. Now, on this, as students of the Ukrainian Catholic University, I am far from an expert in Sergius Bulgakov, and I would refer you to uh, uh, Father Deacon Roman Zavisky, who is an expert in this area. But uh, Sergius Bulgakov was one of the, the pioneers who contributed to the founding of the Fellowship of Saints Alban and Saint Sergius, and he had a proposal for the partial intercommunion. Uh, of Anglican and Orthodox Christians that was inspired by this apocalyptic notion that the world must be coming to an end, which for, for, for Bulgakov was um, in many ways catalyzed and uh, occurred simply on, on the incredulity of his response to the vast uh, persecution of Christianity in the Soviet Union. Uh, there is an excellent article on on this uh, on his ecumenical enterprise by Brandon Gallagher in a book called Church World. Uh, I think it's Church World Mission. Forgive me, and it's edited by William C. Mills. There are essays in honor of Michael Pluckon, and I would uh, urge you to read those. But it's this eschatological impetus that led to a new awareness, a new urgency on the part of pioneers within the Christian communion uh, that established a need to have more meaningful ecumenical dialogue. Now, we've already said that Vatican II was partially in response to World War II, the incredulity of the epic loss of life, the method that was used, and I've alluded to this before, so I won't, um, I won't go, uh, I won't go into the details on this. That Vatic, that the fathers of Vatican II used was to employ Eastern sources to enrich the theological and liturgical textures in honor of the Catholicity of the Church. For more information on this, read Massimo Fagioli's book, 
True Reform, where he comments on Sacrosanctum Concilium being the first ecclesiological document and teaching of Vatican II. I already talked about the Apostolic Constitution of Pope Paul VI on Confirmation and how this was an adoption of Eastern Christian pneumatology and liturgical Byzantinization. In addition to that, the three new Eucharistic prayers that were added to uh, the sacramentary of the Roman Church in the Missal of Paul VI were based upon non-Roman paradigms. Uh, one of them, in fact, was inspired by the Egyptian version of the Anaphora of St. Basil the Great. Um, so part of what's going on here is that Vatican II was embracing a truly Catholic confession of faith, meaning that the confession of faith was, uh, was an acknowledgement of churchliness, a valid churchness, if you will, in other churches uh, besides the Roman church. This is a, a, a very important ecclesiological shift in the Roman Catholic Church, which had a huge reverberations throughout global Christianity, and yet, interestingly enough, did not resolve the problem of schism, which continues to endure today. Uh, a good example of the popularity of uh, and the ecumenical relevance of Roman Catholic work was that many Protestant churches adopted the model of the right of Christian initiation of adults that was established after Vatican II in the Roman Church and also adopted the model of a three-year lectionary of the Roman Church. This is ecumenical theology. These liturgical adaptations are ecumenical theology. It's liturgical sharing. What, what's very unfortunate in this paradigm is that um, these adaptations still did not result in the uh, resolution of the schism between the churches. Okay, so I have two more slides to go through to get to the conclusion. First, I want to continue with the 20th century approach. Uh, what I've talked about in the approaches here is that this is ultimately two things. Resource Mont combined with an increased and intensified eschatological awareness of, of having to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, a unified church standing before the judgment seat of Christ is the most persuasive argument for mercy, which uh, leads to instances of profound acceptance of churchliness. The Roman church recognizing churchliness in the Eastern churches, Protestant churches recognizing the churchliness of the Roman church in this liturgical sharing. Now, what we see here in the 20th century approach, what we might add to this, is affirmations of what the churches have in common. This is really what ecumenical theology has been. What do we have in common? So the production of documents that state what the churches have in common. Uh, another example of this is to affirm the orthodoxy of other churches. In this instance, to revert, to revert things that, uh, that statements that had been made in the past. Uh, Robert Taft, the Jesuit liturgical scholar, says that the Roman Catholic acceptance of the validity of the Anaphora Avade and Mari, which is an East Syrian prayer, which does not contain the institution narrative, is perhaps the finest ecumenical achievement in Roman Catholic history. To be able to, to look at a prayer from another tradition which is clearly in contradistinction to Roman Catholic teaching that an institution narrative has to be there because it shows that Jesus instituted the Eucharist, which is the, one of the, found, the building blocks of all of scholastic sacramental theology, is truly an ecumenical achievement. It's an honoring of an aspect of another tradition that is completely different. Um, we also have reaching out on the part of the Roman Church. Utunum Sint, Pope John Paul II's uh, encyclical that invites the Eastern churches to a discussion on the proper exercise of primacy by the Bishop of Rome is an, an example of reaching out, of, of seeking input on Roman particularities that are, continue to be stumbling blocks in ecumenical dialogue. 
And we see that there are, are numerous, uh, two examples in international and uh, local levels, Ravenna North American Consultation Center Filioque uh, have led to the adoption of proposals that would end, that would eradicate the Filioque as a church dividing issue. And I think that Pope Francis's, in continuity with uh, Pope John Paul II, stating and honoring the martyrdom of the Armenian church and honoring in this Armenian genocide is yet another approach. It's to participate in the light uh, and to honor the event in the life of another church, which, uh, which had an impact on that church and the Armenian genocide in a certain, in, uh, was catastrophic for the life of the Armenian church because it led to the eradication and the complete uh, demolition of the intelligentsia from the hierarchy and uh, the theological apparatus of the Armenian church in the early 20th century. I'm going to conclude this lecture by giving you my own thoughts on what need, needs to be done. And I'm saying this because it is my opinion as somebody who's worked in uh, ecumenical theology for eight years now, that uh, the nuclear disarmament of the early 21st century and the phenomenon of globalization have seemed to increase ecclesial polarization and diminished the ecumenical impetus. Um, in other words, uh, ecumenical dialogue is not the, the, the highest priority on the agendas of the churches any longer. My proposal for a new approach is to ecumenical dialogue. I have seven proposals. The first proposal is that the churches should converge on, common, on one common religious pro problem. And I believe that uh, discussion on this problem could yield fruit in resolving the problem of primacy. But it's not only resolving the problem of primacy, it's addressing what one might refer to as the white elephant in the room. And that issue is, what is the proper exercise of the office of the bishop? This is a problem that afflicts uh, most churches today. The sacramental ontology, the difference in that approach on holy orders between the Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestant churches is the bi biggest stumbling block to dialogue with Protestant traditions. At the core of this discussion is the meaning of a symbol and the degree to which a symbol mediates a experience and an encounter with, uh, with the divine, with God. If the Catholic, Protestant, and uh, Orthodox traditions could come together and come to a common understanding of what symbols do in the liturgy, I believe that this could be the beginning of a process of composing definitions of an Episcopal ministry that could excise from contemporary definitions of Episcopal ministry uh, medieval inscriptions of vertical relationships, like, for example, in the Orthodox Church, Byzantinisms from the imperial era that continue to exist in the celebration of what we call a hierarchical or a pontifical liturgy. This is a, a very important and an underdeveloped area of ecumenical theology that could yield great fruit. Two, the common enterprise of saving lives. This is to honor the image of God everywhere. Um, this is related to point number seven, so I'll do these two together here. The current new wave of martyrdom that we see uh, resulting as a consequence, as a tragedy from uh, terrorism across the globe, particularly with the crisis of ISIS, the church's response to this has to be the enterprise of saving lives. This is a time for the churches to come together ecumenically and to focus on an area in which every Christian agrees, and that is that every human being bears the divine image of God 
and is worthy of uh, salvation and of love. Uh, two areas, obviously, would be to go into areas where Christians are at great risk and to protect them and to give them safe refuge. Uh, the collection of monies into a common ecumenical account where refugees who are, are being forced out of their homes in places where uh, ISIS is forcing them out um, is one possible dimension. And here the Christians should very strongly consider providing homes also for Muslims who are being forced out of their homes in uh, the persecution that is imposed uh, by ISIS upon uh, those uh, who are victims. Another necessity here would be to protect women and children from the, resur the unfortunate resurgence in human trafficking, particularly in uh, the sale of women and children into the, the sex trade throughout the world. The third point would be to have meaningful ecumenical discourse on some of the most urgent cultural problems of postmodernity. And here I have in mind the problem of loneliness and the isolation of human beings. Um, Pavel Ambros, a Jesuit scholar who is at Olomouc University in, uh, in Moravia, in the eastern part of the Czech Republic, uh, recently said in a lecture that uh, a lot of the problems that we're seeing in the world uh, are exacerbated by technology, which uh, actually takes humans out of the local community and uh, with the prevalence of social media really creates problems of loneliness where uh, people are cut off from their natural environment where they would be in contact with peers and elders in a community and thus seek refuge uh, from adults who exercise a bad influence on them. And this would be a wonderful ecumenical enterprise uh, a new problem that has emerged and been exacerbated by social media and by technology. Um, on here, we might uh, also have Christians coming together in unified statements that condemn the violence and the bloodshed that, uh, that this problem of loneliness contributes to. And uh, one might even go so far as to honor the new martyrs by commemorating them on local liturgical calendars, which would be in continuity with the practice of uh, receiving liturgical traditions from the other. Step number four would be to continue the common restoration of the holy order of the laity. This was an ecumenical enterprise that gained momentum in the early 20th century. Many Christian commentators believe that the most urgent task is to reform the clergy, but the first step in strengthening our, our cadre of clergy and our roster of clergy is to strengthen the laity because the clergy come from the laity. The fifth is to reform the episcopacy and the notion of primacy. I've already talked about this in point number one. Um, Robert Taft has already uh, discussed some of these issues in a recent article that he published in Worship Magazine from January 2015, and so I would refer you to that article. I'm going to end with point number six because I've already talked about eschatological urgency. And I believe that, um, and here I'm going to paraphrase Patriarch Daniel of Romania, of the Romanian Orthodox Church. I believe that ecumenical theology will be strengthened if each person who is committed to the endeavor does so in a spirit of asceticism, self-examination, and repentance. This means that ecumenical theology must begin with reflection on one's own sins and on a reflection on one's own tradition, which will enable one to receive the other tradition in a spirit of charity and thus to view the other not as an enemy, but as a brother or sister or Christ who bears the full image of the divine Son of God. I believe that point number six is the most important point and that this approach could potentially be the primary ingredient that restores ecumenical theology today to uh, one of the most important uh, agenda items 
for all of the Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant churches of the world. I'm sure that this lecture will generate some questions and some discussion, and I welcome them. But uh, most importantly, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to wish you success in everything that you do.